To keep yourself updated, subscribe to Indigo Learn and click the bell icon and download our app OneFin to start learning on the go. Hello dear students, hope you are doing well. Today we are discussing the CA Inter Corporate and other laws paper for November 22 examination. Let's start off. First we will discuss the compulsory question and then all the remaining question of the 70 mark theory portion. Okay, all in all the paper was good. Most of the students they gave a good paper. Most of the questions were also covered from the discussions that we have had. Around 5-10% to of the paper was out of the box, it was unexpected but it is CA paper so of course we can give that much of a margin for unexpected type of questions. Let's dive right into these questions now. So first question, the compulsory one, the A part. Now this is actually the most difficult or the trickiest question of the entire paper. So let's see what this question is saying. Now this question says that the board of directors of SRD Limited which is an unlisted public company, they want to issue debentures okay now they are seeking your advice up to what amount what is the maximum amount of debentures that they can raise okay so that is what they are asking now in this question there are a lot of numbers that are given you have been given the paid up share capital the authorized capital of this company so the equity share capital is 40 lakh rupees the share premium, that is the security premium is 50 lakh rupees, general reserve 30 lakhs, profit and loss account is 20 lakh rupees, capital reserve 30 lakhs, convertible debentures which are already there with the company, sorry, non-convertible debentures are 30 lakh rupees and then the company has taken a term loan from a bank also, this is of 20 lakh rupees, right? Apart from this, the company also has a cash credit which is like a temporary loan that the company has taken from a bank of 50 lakh rupees. Okay. Now the question that they are asking is that what resolution is required to issue debentures and up to how much amount the company can issue debentures. Okay. Now this is not directly coming from section number 71 which we have discussed. It is in fact coming from section number 180 which is not directly in your syllabus, it is in CA final syllabus, but nevertheless, a bit of that has been covered in our syllabus also. So accordingly, this question has been asked. Now here, this section talks about the powers of the board of directors. It says that the board of directors can issue debentures or raise more loan or borrowings up to a certain amount using just board resolution. Okay, so the existing loan, existing borrowing, plus any new borrowings that the company takes if it is more than the paid up share capital of the company plus the free reserves plus the security premium then in that case the company will have to take special resolution otherwise simply board resolution is sufficient so you have to mention this now in this we have to take existing borrowings and new borrowings but we have to exclude the temporary loans all right so accordingly we'll have to solve this question so if we take up the total of paid up share capital, free reserves, general reserves and security premium, then all of this is going to be totaled up. It is going to come to 1.4 crores, right? Now the existing loan is 30 lakh and 20 lakh. We are going to exclude the cash credit because that's a temporary loan. So this combined together is 50 lakh. Okay, so here the existing loan is 50 lakh and the paid up share capital security premium and the general reserve is 1.4 crores. Accordingly, up to 1.4 crores if the company has to raise debentures, then simply board resolution is sufficient. If the company wants to go beyond that, then special resolution has to be taken. Okay, let's see the second part of this question. What will be your answer in case the above company desires to issue debentures with the option to convert these debentures into shares? Okay, so this we have discussed in section number 71, which says that if the company wants to issue convertible debentures, which will be fully or partly converted into equity shares, then the company requires to pass a special resolution. Next question is a very simple question from your audit and auditors chapter number 10 of the Companies Act. This is from disqualifications of the auditor that we have discussed. So here there's a company P Limited. Now this company has appointed X. This company wants to appoint XYZ and company as the audit firm. Okay, now in this particular company, there is Mr. X, Y and Z are the partners. Now you have to explain whether this company can appoint X, Y, Z and company as the auditing firm or not. Right, there are three circumstances which are given. Now in the first part, 
Mrs. Q, who is the wife of Mr. X, who is one of the partners, she holds one lakh rupees of equity shares in P Limited. Now, can this company, can this firm be appointed as auditor? We have discussed in section number one forty one that the partner, the relative, and that person should not be holding any equity shares in the company, except in case of relative, face value of one lakh rupees shares can be held. So, accordingly, here the wife is the relative, and she can hold up to one lakh rupees of shares. It's okay. This firm is not disqualified in first case. Second question is that this Mrs. Q, the wife, she has also given guarantee in relation to a loan to P Limited up to an amount of one lakh fifty thousand rupees. Now here we have discussed that with respect to guarantee amount, the amount should not exceed one lakh rupees in case of that person. Or the relative or the partner, right? So here the relative, that means the wife, she has taken a guarantee of one lakh fifty thousand rupees, which is more than one lakh. Okay, so here the firm is disqualified. Okay, in the next point, Mrs. Q, who is the wife of Mr. X, she is indebted to Z Limited. Okay, not P Limited. Z Limited up to an amount of ten lakh rupees. Now this particular Z Limited, this company P Limited holds one fourth of the paid up share capital of this Z Limited. Okay, now one fourth that means twenty five percent of the equity share capital of Z Limited is held by P Limited. P Limited is the main company, so accordingly here the relation is of associate company. In an associate company, we know one company is holding twenty percent or more of the voting power of another company. So here P Limited becomes the associate company of Z. Okay, now in the associate company also. With respect to loan, the person, the relative, and also the partner, they should not be indebted to more than five lakh rupees. In this case, the amount is ten lakh rupees. So again, here also the firm is disqualified. The next question is from your Indian Contract Act. It is from the contract of guarantee. Okay. Now this is a simple question. Now here there is a person who is Mr. Mani. She is a minor. He has lost his parents in COVID. Now he is taking groceries from another person, Mr. Sohail. Okay, and uh, he will pay back for those groceries later on. Right. Now there is another person, Mr. Ganesh, who is giving the guarantee. In case Manish fails to pay for the groceries, then Mr. Ganesh is going to make the payment of the groceries. Okay. Now later on, what happens after a few months? Manish failed to clear the dues, and Sohail approached Mr. Ganesh, but Mr. Ganesh has refused. He said that I am not going to pay on behalf of Manish, who is a minor. Why? Because of two reasons. He has given two explanations. The first explanation that he has given is that there was no consideration in this contract of guarantee. The second uh, point that he says is that Manish is a minor, and there cannot be a valid contract with a minor. So you have to explain, as per the Indian Contract Act, whether these two points are valid or not. That means, in a contract of guarantee, is consideration required? We have discussed that consideration is not necessary in the case of contract of guarantee. So here, this contention is not valid. The second point that. Here, the principal debtor, that is Mr. Manish, is a minor. Is the contract of guarantee still valid? The answer is yes. The principal debtor can be incapable of contract. Still, the contract of guarantee is going to be valid. So, this contention is also wrong. Okay. So, here, Mr. Ganesh, who is the surety, who has given the guarantee that he will pay in case Manish fails, he will have to make the compensation. Okay. The second part of the question asks: Will your answer differ in case both Manish, that is the principal debtor, and Mr. Ganesh, the surety, both are minors? So, see, in case surety is also incapable of contract, then the contract of guarantee will be invalid. Okay. So, in the contract of guarantee, guarantee the surety has to be capable of contracting. Okay. Principal debtor can be incapable. It's okay. Next question is from your Negotiable Instrument Act. Here is a party, Mr. A. Now, Mr. A has made an endorsement on a bill of exchange of fifty thousand rupees in favor of Mr. B. But later on, Mr. A passes away; he dies. Okay. Now, Mr. A has a son also, that is Mr. S. He is the legal representative of Mr. A. Okay. Now, this person, Mr. B, in whose favor the endorsement was made, he comes to Mr. S and he tells Mr. S that, "Can you give me that instrument? Can you complete the instrument and deliver it to me?" Okay, so here S is willing to complete the instrument. S is the legal representative of Mr. A who has died. Now, as per the Negotiable Instrument Act, is this something that can be done? Okay, so here the relevant section we have discussed is section number fifty-seven. 
which says that in case an endorsement is made on the negotiable instrument and the endorser dies without delivering that instrument to the person then later on his legal representative cannot negotiate that instrument merely based on delivery okay so here accordingly mr s does not have any right he is not capable as per the contract to simply pass on the title to that instrument simply by delivery okay so he cannot complete the instrument simply by delivery let's move on to the second question the a part of the second question is coming from management and administration which is chapter number seven so here we are, we are going to discuss about the EGM, the Extraordinary General Meeting, which is called by Requisitionist. So here there is a company TSD Limited. Now this company has 10,000 equity shares of 10 rupees each. Now here this company receives a requisition from Mr. A and B. Each of them are holding 1,500 equity shares. They want to call an Extraordinary General Meeting to remove the managing director of the company. Now the company fails to call this Extraordinary General Meeting. Right now, can these people themselves call the meeting and pass the resolution? You have to answer that. Right. So here the relevant section is section number 100, which talks about extraordinary general meeting. It can be called by the board of directors. It can also be called by the requisitionist. But in that case, the requisitionist should hold 10%. That is one tenth of the voting power of the company. In case of company with equity shares, one tenth of the equity shares or more than that should be held. So together, Mr. A and B, they are holding 1500, 1500 shares. That means 3000 equity shares they're holding out of 10,000 shares. That is 30% voting right they have. So they can call the meeting or by requisition right so accordingly they will have to follow the procedure which is mentioned in our companies act they will have to sign the requisition and submit it uh, with the board of directors they have to submit it at the company's address they have to both sign this okay now once they submit this then within 21 days the board should proceed with calling the meeting and within 45 days the board should conduct the meeting if that is not done then in that case in three months uh, the companies requisitionist these requisitionists can also hold the meeting so you will have to mention the entire procedure part b now this is coming from your declaration and payment of dividend which is chapter number eight okay so here there is a company which has free reserves of 75 lakh rupees in the last five years this company has not declared any dividends in the last three years now this company wants to propose the dividend in the current year the earned profits of this year are 12 lakh rupees now the company wants to pay 30 lakh rupees of dividend which is 30 percent of the paid up share capital now can the company do so see when we're saying 30 percent of the paid up share capital is 30 lakh rupees then that means the paid up share capital will be one crore rupees we can do this calculation right so this is the paid up share capital of this company okay now the company wants to pay 30 lakh rupees See, existing profits for the current year are 12 lakh rupees. We have discussed in section number 123 that existing profits can be used or the company can use free reserves also or both of them can also be used. But here the existing profits are insufficient. So the company will have to draw something out of the free reserves of the company also, which is 75 lakh rupees. Now, when the company has to use free reserves to pay the dividend, then we know the company has to comply with the declaration and payment of dividend rules. Okay, now in the rules, we have four conditions which are given. Okay, the first condition is that the dividend which is declared by the company should not be more than the average of the preceding three years of dividend. Now, in this particular case, in the last three years, there has not been any dividend. So, accordingly, this condition is not applicable. Okay, the rate of dividend is fine. There's no nothing wrong with the rate of dividend. The first condition is satisfied. The next condition is that the maximum amount the company can withdraw from its reserve should be less than or equal to 10% of the paid up share capital plus free reserves of the company. Okay, so let's calculate this. So paid up share capital is 1 crore, free reserves is 75 lakh. Okay, 10% of that is going to come to 17.5 lakh. This is the maximum amount that can be withdrawn from the free reserves. Okay, so let's say the company withdraws this amount and along with that, the company has existing years profit of 12 lakh rupees also. So we'll combine 12 lakh rupees with 17.5 lakh rupees, which is withdrawn. So together, the company will have 29.5 lakh rupees to pay as dividend. As per the second condition, this is the maximum amount that the company can withdraw. Another condition in the rules is relating to setting off of losses and depreciation. That is irrelevant here. 
Another condition stated is that after the withdrawal from the reserves, the remaining amount in the reserves should be at least 15% of the paid up share capital. The paid up share capital is 1 crore rupees. 15% of 1 crore is 15 lakh rupees. So in the reserves, at least 15 lakh rupees should remain after the withdrawal. That means according to that last condition, we can remove 60 lakh rupees. Okay, so as per one condition, we can remove up to 17.5 lakh rupees and as per the other condition, we can remove up to 60 lakh rupees. Okay, so that means the maximum amount that can be withdrawn from the reserve is lesser of these two, that is 17.5 lakh rupees. Okay, so this is the maximum amount we can withdraw. So accordingly, the company can pay up to 29.5 lakh rupees as dividend. The next question is from the Indian Contract Act, which is from the contract of agency. There is a person, Mr. X. Okay, he owes to Mr. Y 50,000 rupees. Now, this person, Mr. X, appoints Mr. Y as the agent. Okay, so X has to pay 50,000 rupees to Mr. Y. Okay, but apart from that, Mr. Y has been appointed as the agent also and X is the principal here. Okay, the work that has been given is to sell the flat in Bangalore. In this case, it is said that whatever amount is recovered, part of it has to be kept by Mr. Y as a due of 50,000 rupees and any compensation if there is and the remaining has to be repaid back to Mr. X. Okay, now here Mr. X wants to revoke this contract of agency. Can he do so? So in this we have discussed section 202 in which we have discussed agency contract wherein the agent's interest is involved. Okay, contract coupled with interest. Okay, so here in this case, if suppose the agent has any interest in the contract, he has to recover some amount and the principal wants to cancel out this contract of agency, this cannot be done. Okay, such contract of agency coupled with interest cannot be revoked. So here Mr. X cannot revoke this contract of agency. Next question is from the Negotiable Instrument Act. This is also a very, very simple question. We have discussed this kind of question. So, Venkat has executed a promissory note in favor of Raman for 45 lakh rupees. The amount is payable 100 days after sight. So, this is a time instrument. This is not a demand instrument. It is a time instrument. Now, the, now this instrument has been presented for sight on 4th of May. Okay, you have to calculate the date of maturity. Okay, so from 4th of May, it is payable 100 days after sight. So, we'll add 100 days. And apart from 100 days, we'll also add 3 grace days. Okay, and accordingly, you will get the date of maturity. Next question, question number 3, part A. It is very, very simple. If you have covered chapter number 1, if you have learned the definition of listed company, then this is a question directly from there. And we have discussed this before. So, here you have been asked whether the following companies will be considered listed companies or unlisted companies. So we have discussed in section number 2, clause 52, the definition of listed company in which any company that has any securities listed on the recognized stock exchange will be considered listed companies except those which are prescribed in the rules in consultation with SEBI. Now, in the prescribed uh, rules there are certain types of companies which have been excluded okay it includes any public company which has listed non-convertible debt securities on private placement basis so this is again this is not listed this is this is not listed as per our prescribed rules again another public company which has listed its non-convertible redeemable preference shares in private placement basis as per SEBI regulations is also not to be considered as listed company same way any public company which has not listed its equity shares on recognized stock exchange but whose equity shares are listed on stock exchange in the jurisdiction as per section 23 will also not be considered as listed company so all these three points they will not be considered as listed companies moving on the next question is also very very simple it is from chapter number 9 section number 137 it talks about filing the financial statements of the company with the registrar of companies okay so here there is a company which is moon limited in this company the government of rajasthan and the government of haryana jointly hold 58 percent of the paid up share capital of the company so this becomes a government company now, the audited financial statements of this company for the financial year 21-22 were placed at the annual general meeting on the 31st August. However, pending the comments of the CAG, the said accounts, the meeting was adjourned without adopting the accounts. Okay, so what happens? 
the first time the annual general meeting is held because the accounts are not finalized the opinion of the cag is not received therefore the meeting is adjourned okay now here the company did not file its financial statements with the registrar of companies okay now here we know as per section 137 whenever the annual general meeting is held even if the financial statements are not finalized they are not approved still the financial statements in a provisional basis they have to be filed with the registrar of companies uh, within 30 days right and when the adjourned meeting is finally held and the financial statements are approved after that the finalized ones are also to be sent to the registrar of companies within 30 days so here in the first annual general meeting when the financial statements are not approved they still should have been filed to the registrar of companies but the company did not file it so the compliance of section 137 is not done by the company afterwards on receiving the cag comments on the 5th of october the adjourned annual general meeting is held and after that the financial statements are filed by the company on the 25th of october so see after the finalization of the financial statements within 30 days the company has filed with the roc the financial statements but on the first annual general meeting the provisional financial statements were not filed within 30 days so there the compliance has not been done by the company so the next question is from the negotiable instrument act a bill of exchange was drawn by mr g on h for fifty thousand rupees towards the value of the goods by mr h from mr g now mr h accepted the bill of exchange so h is the acceptor of the bill of exchange and it has been given to mr g mr g is the drawer okay now mr h accepted the bill and returned to mr g after that g handed over the bill to the supplier k to settle the amount of the transaction on the due date k presented the bill to mr h okay so on the due date k goes to h to ask for the payment right mr h denies to make the payment and the bill is dishonored now after five days of that k gave a written notice to mr g okay so k has the bill of exchange he went to mr h got the bill dishonored within five days he gave a written notice to mr g we know that whenever the bill of exchange is dishonored then it is the duty of the holder of the bill of exchange to give notice to all the previous parties who he wants to make liable so accordingly k also gave the notice to mr g in writing okay now there was a problem he was not knowing the fact that g has already passed away one day back so g died and k was not aware about it okay now after one month mr k k claims the amount from mr l who is a legal representative of mr g so mr g has a son that is mr l mr g has passed away he's died okay k gave the notice to g without knowing that g has passed away after one month he goes to mr l and asks for the money now l says that listen i did not even get the notice so i'm not liable to you okay so here you have to explain as per the negotiable instrument act what should happen okay so mr l contended that the notice of notice of dishonor was neither served to him nor he had received the notice of dishonor which was sent by mr a mr k addressing to his father therefore he is not liable to the bill as per the negotiable instrument act we have to advise okay now in the negotiable instrument act we have discussed section number 97 which talks about this exact situation that let's say a bill of exchange or a promissory note is dishonored and the notice is given by the holder to any previous party and the previous party has died and the holder does not know about the death of this person but he simply gives the notice to that person in that case that notice is valid and it is sufficient okay why because the sender who was the holder of the instrument he does not know about the death of the person so in this case the notice sent by mr k is sufficient even though l is denying it so here l the legal representative is going to be valid okay the second part of this question says would your answer differ in case mr l contended that even though he received the notice it was addressed to his father since it was not addressed to him he is not liable okay so see here l who is a legal representative 
let's say he makes this contention that listen i got the notice but that notice was for my father it was not for me you should have sent the notice in my name okay so with respect to that we have discussed section number 94 which says that yes in case of death of any person the notice of dishonor has to be given to the legal representative in his own name however in this particular case again quoting section number 97 mr k did not know that mr g has died had he known that mr g has died he would have sent the notice in the name of mr l okay so here again in my understanding the contention is wrong and the notice is sufficient but we'll see how the institute frames the answer in this case next question is simple from interpretation of statutes explain grammatical and logical interpretation and state in which situation the court adopts these in india so when we say grammatical that means merely the words of the language of the statute has to be used whereas when we say logical it means that we have to go beyond what the words say beyond the grammar and we have to understand the overall perspective of the legislation and accordingly the courts also generally prefer grammatical one however in case grammatical interpretation is not giving the valid solution then they will refer to the logical interpretation next question is from your chapter share capital and debentures this is also a very very simple question it is coming from section number 61 talking about alteration of share capital so there is a company anika limited which has authorized capital of 10 lakh equity shares of 100 rupees each now some of the shareholders they want to reduce the price of the shares from 100 rupees to 10 rupees to make it easy to trade on the stock market okay can this be done by the company so here we have to quote section number 61 yes the company can go ahead with this it should be authorized by the article of association ordinary resolution has to be passed right so you will have to quote this uh, subdividing the shares the nomination of the shares into lesser number that is a possible alteration of share capital the next question is from your chapter registration of charges this is a four mark question So here the company has some secured deposit of hundred crore rupees that are issued for three years with twelve percent interest per annum. Now, with respect to securities, the following asset details is given: land and building, plant and machinery, factory share, trademark, goodwill. Now you have to check the validity of the charges that are created. according to the acceptance of deposits rules 2014 so we have discussed that when secured deposits are issued secured debentures bonds are issued then the security should not include any intangible assets so trademark and goodwill will not be included as securities we are going to consider only these three okay land and building plant and machinery and factory share the total is 100 crore rupees the second thing we had discussed is that the bonds the value of the bonds should not exceed the market value of these securities along with the interest okay so here as we can see the bond itself is of 100 crore rupees plus there is 12% per annum interest also okay now here the security is in total of 100 crore rupees so that means here the security is insufficient okay so accordingly we'll have to say that the charge created is insufficient Next question is very simple from the general clause act Mr A the landlord who is staying in Delhi rented his flat in Bangalore to Mr B so Mr B is the tenant here Mr A is the landlord here now if A requires his flat to be vacated one month prior notice has to be given to Mr B right now after 8 months a notice is sent by Mr A to Mr B to vacate his flat by registered post which is refused to be accepted by mrs c who is the wife of mr b mr b denies to vacate the house okay so here one month prior notice is sent by the landlord to the tenant by registered post okay and it is not accepted by the wife of the tenant and the tenant is saying no i am not going to vacate the house so you have to examine as per the general clause act whether the notice is tenable or not so in the general clause act we have discussed in section number 27 that the notice has to be properly addressed it has to be prepaid and it has to be sent by registered post okay if all of these three conditions are satisfied then the notice is valid as per the general clause act so in the given case we assume that the address is correct it is of course prepaid and sent by registered post so if all three conditions are satisfied it's a valid notice 
Next question is a direct question from interpretation of statutes. It wants you to explain the rule of adjustum generis when it is not applicable. So rule of adjustum generis, uh, generis means that specific words are there which are forming a class of items and after that general words are mentioned in the statute. So in that case the general words will also mean the same class of items that the specific words are being used for. Okay, now this is not applicable if the legislation has a different intention. Lawmakers wanted something else to be construed by the general words or if suppose this is an exhaustive list of items. The specific words mean an exhaustive class of items. More items cannot be added in it or if the uh, when we are reading the statute different meaning is coming out. Okay, in all those situations it will not be applicable. Let's move on. The next question is from prospectus and allotment of securities. So we have a company, Arna Limited, which is dealing in the export of cotton fabrics. The company issues a prospectus, okay, in which some report of the export is attached. Now this report is untrue. It is false. Now Mr. Nick purchased the shares of this company on the basis of the experts report, but he did not suffer any loss. Okay, now you have to explain whether Mr. Nick has any remedy. Okay, now here Mr. Nick has purchased the shares based on the prospectus in which the exports report is there, which is not true, but he has not suffered any loss. So, the, can he claim any benefits? Can he claim any damages from the company? Well, the answer is no. We have discussed it in section number 35. That the subscriber can claim damages from the directors of the company and the experts if he has suffered losses and he has relied on the prospectus. Here, he has not suffered any losses. So, he does not have any remedy. Next thing is, uh, state the circumstances in which the expert will not be liable under the Companies Act. When will the export not be liable? So this we have discussed in section 35 plus also in section number 26. If suppose the export does not give any consent uh, to include his report or if suppose he has given the consent but he has withdrawn the consent and given a public notice, he will not be liable. Okay. Or else if his report is published but he did not give the report in the capacity of an expert. It was a general opinion. All, in all of these situations, the expert will not be liable. Now, in question number 5a, there is an alternate question also that you can attempt. Let's read that. The articles of AB Limited provide that the documents will have to be served by speed post. Now, a shareholder of the company, he served the notice or documents to the company by courier. Now, the company refused to accept it, saying that in the articles, we have written that you have to submit the documents by speed post. As per the Companies Act, you have to explain, can the company refuse to accept the documents? Well, see, we have discussed section number 20 relating to submitting the documents to the company. Documents can be submitted by post, courier, or speed post, etc. Right? So, here in section number 20, courier is an allowed way of submitting documents to the company. Right? So, the Companies Act says that courier is allowed. Even if the articles say that courier is not allowed, only speed post is allowed. But because we know that the Companies Act overrides the article of association as per section number 6, therefore, here the contention of the company is not valid. Okay? They will have to uh, accept the documents. Okay? Now, in this case, can Suresh claim any damages? The answer is yes. Moving on, the next question is from Registration of Charges Chapter. Okay, it's about the satisfaction of the charge. So, there is a company, Nivedita Limited. They have hypothecated its plant with a nationalized bank. Okay, now the company registered the charge with the registrar of companies. Company settled the term loan. It has repaid the amount in full. Company requested the bank to issue a letter confirming the settlement. The bank did not respond to the request. State the relevant provisions of the company's act to register the satisfaction of the charge. State the time frame up to which the registrar of the companies may allow the company to intimate satisfaction. So regarding satisfaction, we have discussed section 82, which says that once the charge is satisfied, within 30 days, the satisfaction must be registered with the registrar of companies. Otherwise, within 300 days of satisfaction by paying additional fees, this registration of satisfaction of charge can be done. Right. In that case, the ROC, once they receive the intimation, they will send a notice to the charge holder for 14 days. 
within 14 days if the charge holder has any restrictions objections then they can object the registration of satisfaction otherwise the satisfaction will be registered by the registrar of companies and a certificate is going to be issued next question is also very very simple it's from the contract act it is from bailment so there's a person mr karthik who took his ac to pratik okay who is an electrician for repair so this is bailment who is the bailer here the bailer is karthik the bailee is pratik okay now even after numerous follow ups uh, pratik did not return the ac in reasonable time then pratik's electric shop caught fire and then ac was destroyed decide whether pratik is going to be liable as per the indian contract act so we have discussed section 160 and section 161 which say that it is a duty of the bailee to return the goods after completing the purpose okay and they have to return it within reasonable time also if suppose the goods are not returned in reasonable time then in that case the bailee is going to be liable for any damages that are caused to the bailor so in this case here the here pratik who is the bailor oh sorry who is the bailee he is going to be liable to kartik who is the bailor next question is also a direct question from general laws act you have to define official gazette it's covered in section 3 clause 30 Nine. It simply says that official gazette means the official gazette of the state or of India. Okay. So these were all the different questions that came in your seventy mark theory portion of your C enter law paper in November twenty two. What do you think about the paper? How was your paper? How much did you attempt? How much did you attempt write correctly? Please do write it down in the comments. And um, in my opinion, I think most of the paper was doable. It was good. It was nice, except like maybe five to ten percent of the portion which was slightly tricky. But rest of the questions they were direct. If you have just studied the syllabus, you must be knowing the answer. Okay, so we'll see you again another time. Bye bye. Thank you.